What has been knocked down here by the factory story is that this civic pride policy objective had been attempted before and it had been abandoned. A period of avid metropolitan neo-modernist planning took place in the 1950s and 60s and the objective first laid out 1945 City of Manchester plan to eradicate a Victorian heritage of unplanned urban sprawl due to which Manchester lacked a vivid civic identity and instead it was to plan a, a circle of satellite towns in the Garden City style of 1930s Withenshaw, the hub for which would be an entirely regenerated city centre of impressive modern offices and prominent civic amenities, a flagship city to compete with other second cities like Chicago, Manchester's model. Now, I'm going to show you a list of modern build, modernist buildings, post-war modernist buildings in Manchester. I've left out Salford because I couldn't get the information in time. So this is a list of major post-war concrete, glass and steel buildings in the conurbation from the surreal toast rack of 1958 through the towers, co-op 62, Mobile 65 and Maths 68 to the Royal Exchange's space pod of 1976. To, to remind you this to, of, of the scale of post-war neo-modernist commercial and institutional building. Meanwhile, the post-war pressure for council housing and the lack of cash and resources led instead of garden cities to huge inner city demolition programs started in 1954 and the hurried construction of overspill estates uh, such as Hattersley and Langley, followed by a hassled second phase in uh, the 1961 development plan out of which sprouted those inner city modernist monsters Fort Ardwick and the Hume Crescents, both completed by 1972 and so hastily built that within two years many of the units were uninhabitable. Correspondingly, many of the new concrete, steel and glass commercial and institutional buildings were neither varied nor coordinated enough to withstand public disapproval. A notorious example of this being the, the complex around the maths tower, the precinct centre, the computer centre and the Royal Northern College where the streets in the sky um, walkways were designed by different architects at different heights and couldn't be connected up. So contrary to the view presented in the factory documentary, the image that Manchester presented to the world was not of a derelict city, but of a comprehensively modern one that had got it wrong. In fact, those are the very words that Councillor Alan Roberts, Chair of Manchester Council's Housing Committee, expressed in 1977, adding, quote, Manchester's not been doing its job. He admitted this after being cornered by burgeoning sets of tenants action groups whose campaigns are well documented in Peter Shapley's 2006 essay for the journal Social History. The newly formed strategic overlord, the Greater Manchester Metropolitan County of 1974, identified a clear solution, which turned out to be the default postmodern reaction of the period translated, into, uh, translated to the housing amenities and image needs of the conurbation. That is, conversion of existing buildings rather than demolition, identifying conservation areas such as Castlefield, marketing notions of legacy, pedestrianising the city centre, and the initial attempts within the city at caging modernism within a bricked heritage. Firstly, and most sensationally, by the Royal Exchange Theatre in 1976, and in that sense, merely following on the Hacienda of 1982 and the Corner House of 1983. It's in this postmodern con context that I must place the birth of the fall. And here I move to my second theme. By using this tired term postmodern, the implication is that the city's music scene endured a modernist phase. Indeed, we can 
identify bands spawned in the area at the time of the late 1960s that were progressive and, more importantly, utopian and internationalist in tendency. Barclay James Harvest, Van de Graaff Generator, and 10CC. The mid-1970s punk scene was certainly a cartoon-like reaction um, uh, to, to groups like them. While in response to that, the effervescent post-punk scene was in general more integrative, tending to mesh convention, such as song form, with experimentation, and to link punk's gestural luddism with a curiosity for technology and sound production on stage or, or in the studio. And in the end, it might be claimed that Van de Graaff Generator's appearance at UMIST on the 8th of May 1976 was more influential to local post-punk aesthetics than the Sex Pistols two gigs at the lesser Free Trade Hall in the early summer of 1976. For the record, I attended the second uh, Sex Pistol gigs with, gig with Tony Wilson. And strong as they were, the Pistols were never as effective as local band The Worst, the best full-on rock group I ever heard because it was so basic. So, this post-punk integrative disposition was informed by existent coordinates in the mid-1970s air. These influences are not often noted <laughs> in journalistic histories. Uh, one such coordinate was the resurgent folk scene, um, uh, folk music scene, uh, through which the Lancashire accent was resolutely propelled, in particular by singer-comedian Mike Harding, uh, and uh, Bob Williamson. Yet the conscious assertion of a local accent in line with the emergent promotion of a heritage culture turned to deep embarrassment um, with the national success in April 1978 of Brian and Michael's glutinous homage to L.S. Lowry, Matched Up Men and Matched Up Cats and Dogs. And while Ian Curtis of Joy Division maintained his affected American brogue in order to summon ghosts, others, like Mark Smith, would start to adopt ironized or embroidered accents, not in order to represent, but to stress the exceptional act of performance. Nevertheless, in 1978, Paul Morley would excitedly review in the NME a Manchester musician's collective, collective gig under the headline, quote, These are the Mancunian Mancunians. And when the conurbation started to reassess its matchstock inheritance, it found inside its dilapidated warehouses post-punk musicians already there, practicing. In renting the heritage, they were doing little for their health in those dank, freezing echo chambers, but they were working there in order to prepare for gigs in old buildings such as the Squat, a derelict music college, disheveled clubs with dog-eared music licenses such as the Cypress Tavern and the Russell Club, or youth clubs like the Bowden Vale Youth Club. Rehearsal rooms, four-track studios, Chaz Banks, uh, Kevin Cummings, quid deals the size of Mars bars, Oz PA, Alan Wise, Ray Bid Records were all part of the micro music industry that sprang up in a state of alternative enterprise, of which factory was the Icarus figure. It was new hormones run by a non-Mancunian that did succeed and which gave the fall its start in a recording studio.